I'm Jillian Lester, Dean of Columbia Law School. It's an honor to be here today as part of the first Columbia University Women's Conference. Your voices, both individually and as a collective, are strong. And I feel privileged to be part of this community of difference makers who have and will continue to open doors for women all over the world. Like all of you, I'm looking forward to hearing from Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We're truly fortunate to be able to call Justice Ginsburg a Colombian. In addition to being a graduate of the law school's class of 1959, she was our first women tenured professor in the law school. Like the university, the law school is a very different place than it was in 1926 when women were first admitted, and in 1959 when Justice Ginsburg graduated as one of just 12 women in her graduating class. And I might add, she tied for first place in her class. In 1986, the law school appointed its first woman dean in Barbara Black, who was also the first woman to be appointed dean of a Morningside-based professional school and the first female dean of an Ivy League law school. Today, we're proud that a majority of the women in our class, like entering class of, of 2017, were women, 51%. And this leadership in advancing women is true for the university as a whole as well. Let me offer just two examples of that leadership. First of all, I'm one of many female deans on uh, this campus. In fact, we have women heading a full half of Columbia's schools. Another example. Nationally, the percentage of women in undergraduate engineering programs hovers around 20%. The most recent incoming class at Columbia Engineering, 49% female. So we should take pride in how far we've come, but we can never lose sight of the road ahead. I'd like to introduce another distinguished Columbian President Lee Bollinger, class of 1971, law school class of 1971, he has done so much to open Columbia's doors in this, in this and other ways. And before he came to Columbia, when he was president of the University of Michigan, he worked to keep the doors of higher education open to people of all races, classes, and, back, and, and backgrounds. He argued famously the landmark case of Grutter versus Bollinger. And do you know who uh, was judging that case? Among others, our uh, Justice Ginsburg. So thank you all for being here today. And please join me in welcoming President Lee Bollinger. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jillian, for your introduction. Uh, and for being dean of the law school. I have a very special place in my heart for law school deans, having been one. And Jillian is one of the very, very best. I want to recognize a few people at the beginning. My wife, Jean, over here. An artist, and no, there's no stronger or insightful advocate for the rights of women uh, than Jean. Justice Ginsburg, of course, whom I'll say a few things about in a moment, and her family members with us today, including her daughter Jane, who is a member of our law school faculty. Uh, 
I want to thank the conference organizers, Teresa sabuto Crean and Kathleen Crowley. Thank you very much. I want to thank the trustees, the deans and faculty, and the alumni and guests who are here. Today's program and the many events held throughout this quite extraordinary weekend pay homage to Dr. Winifred Edgerton Merrill and all the remarkable Columbia women who have followed her. This the university conference is the product of extensive planning and coordination among Columbia's 18 affiliated schools. It's a collective effort, and we thank all of you who have brought this about. I want to thank Poppy Harlow, who will be moderating the discussion you will be treated to in just a moment. Poppy is a graduate of the Columbia College class of 2005. She co-anchors CNN Newsroom and is the host of Boss Files with Poppy Harlow. Poppy also just gave birth to her second son four days ago. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to introduce Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That was not part of my remarks. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg is an alumna of Columbia Law School, as Jillian said, and the first woman to become a tenured member of the law school faculty. She co-founded the ACLU's Women's Rights Project, and while teaching at Rutgers University in the 1960s, she was an early leader in the fight for equal wages for women. In the 1970s, her advocacy before the Supreme Court succeeded in winning five decisions that would lay the foundation for our modern jurisprudence protecting women's and men's rights. And in the quarter century since she has served as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg has distinguished herself by authoring majority opinions that secured the basic rights for vulnerable and the disenfranchised and writing forcefully in dissent to keep alive the claims of voters, denied access to the polls, and women denied equal pay for work. But it is difficult to convey, even through this list of outsized accomplishments, what the full meaning and importance of Justice Ginsburg's presence in the public arena is to this nation, and even to us, in this hall, all committed, people gathered here on this rainy February day to listen to her speak. What we know is that she is brave and determined to speak with the moral clarity that is channeled by a keen intellect and impeccable legal skills. She gives voice to those with legitimate claims on our Constitution and our society's ideals, but who lack the political power to secure those rights. Her voice is authentic, strong, and filled with heart. In an area I know well of race in America and the importance of affirmative efforts to redress the dreadful legacy and continuing reality of segregation and discrimination Justice Ginsburg's opinions have been by far the most compelling, not only in supporting those efforts, but also in arguing in favor of a clear and self-conscious openness about what we are doing, when others would approve, but only on the condition that our purposes be disguised by other motives, not about redressing racial inequities. On a more general level, in the world today, 
there is an unnerving trend that constitutes a threat to something that we usually take for granted, namely the rule of law. This simple principle undergirds everything. The notion that there is something we commit ourselves to as a nation and as a world that stands above and beyond what individuals and parties, no matter how powerful, may want. Few nations today or in history embrace this concept, which means it's both extraordinary and forever fragile, and has not by any means always been adhered to even by our own country. Insofar as we are facing and will face challenges to this very basic concept, there is no one we can count on more than Justice Ginsburg. Finally, no introduction of the justice would be complete without recognizing her status as a legitimate pop star. <laughs> the subject of a famed Tumblr account, myriad memes, and countless tributes on social media. Her admirers come from all corners of society, and appreciation for her career extends beyond the boundaries of age, gender, sex, and profession. Rather than trivialize her accomplishments, these emotional attachments speak to the power of her inspiring example. We are always grateful when Justice Ginsburg is able to make time to return to Columbia, and especially so on this occasion. A university-wide women's conference at Columbia would simply feel amiss without the presence of Justice Ginsburg. For in every way that matters, she is the one who has opened the door for all of us. Thank you. Justice Ginsburg. Don't, 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 notorious. Isn't that the notorious B.I.G.? That song? is. <laughs> and he, you, and I have something in common. Yes. That we all share a deep appreciation and love for the great borough of Brooklyn, which I still call home. Yes. And which is where she was born and raised. We appreciate you being here, Justice. Thank you so much. So there's a well, lot. Well, I appreciate <laughs> your being here. I mean, it's fabulous, isn't it, that she is here? Four days after the birth of her second child. Thank you. It, it's an interview that I couldn't miss, and an interview, frankly, on a personal note that I discussed with my husband while I was pregnant. Can I do this? Should I do this? Uh, without hesitation, he said, of course you should do it. And he is who is home in Brooklyn with our children, just as, as your late husband, Marty, was a hugely active father uh, in raising your children. And you've said without him and all he did, you could not be where you are. So to the great men in our lives as well, right? Yes. Uh, we will get to, to all of that in a moment, but we are thrilled you're here. Thank you for the lovely introduction, President Bollinger. A few other things I wanted to add. Um, you know, before the justice attended Columbia Law School, a great decision on her part, she attended Harvard Law School, one of only nine women. And when she began, she was asked to defend why. Why did she deserve to take a seat that a man would take in that class? She went on to work as an attorney. As a young law professor, she was told it was okay that she was being paid less than the men doing the exact same job as her because her husband had a good job. That didn't sit well with her. She would go on to fight for change for decades and decades. She calls herself, your words, not mine, a flaming feminist litigator, correct? <laughs> And 
when she was nominated to the Supreme Court in, the, in 1993 by President Clinton, his words, a person of immense character. She would go on to be confirmed 96 to 3, something uh, we don't see these days very often in Washington. Survived cancer twice, did not miss a single day on the bench. And it is our honor to have her here. We, of course, will respect the fact that sitting justices do not discuss current cases or likely pending cases before the court. So let me begin with this question then. In your first argument as an attorney before the court, you quoted the feminist, the attorney, the abolitionist, Sarah Grimke, who said in 1837, I ask no favor for my sex. All I ask of our brethren is, is that, that they, they take, take their feet off our necks. <laughs> it, had, it had a certain shock quality, which is what I attended. I, wanted to get the attention. Are their feet off our necks today? <laughs> Much more so than I ever dreamed would be possible in my growing up years. Hmm. Let's begin with the Me Too movement, a moment where sexual harassment has thankfully come to the fore. Action is being taken. We are talking about it, doing something about it. But you lived this. As a college student, you lived sexual harassment. You say, we didn't call it that at the time. We didn't have a word for it. What happened to you, and how did you respond? I can tell just uh, one of, of many stories. I was at Cornell University. I was taking a chemistry course. I was not very good in in the lab work, so Neither there was, was I. instructor who who helped me uh, get through. And when it came, when exam time came around, he said, "I'll give you a practice exam." Mm. And I went in very confident that I'd be able to deal with the exam the next day. It turned out it was the practice exam. Mm. And I knew just what he expected in return. Mm. There were many incidents like that. But in those days, the attitude was, what can we do about it? Well, nothing. Boys will be boys. But I don't think you're someone who just did nothing about it. Yeah, well, in his case, I said, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> And it, it, was, it was a challenge for me because I had to make some mistakes so that I wouldn't get 100% <laughs> on the exam. Mm. But you spoke up. Okay. You spoke up. So I often sit as we cover this issue on my show and as I read the incredible reporting you know, of, of the journalists who uncovered so much of this. But what difference will this movement make do you believe? I think it will have staying power. And on the subject of sexual harassment, I'd like to mention the name of a law professor, Catherine McKinnon. Mm -hmm. In the days when I was teaching at Columbia Law School, I received a manuscript from the publisher. It was sexual harassment in the workplace. Mm -hmm. I read it, and the argument was that this is gender-based discrimination that should be subject to control under Title VII. Mm -hmm. There had been no such effort before Catherine McKinnon. I think she deserves tremendous credit for identifying the problem. Mm -hmm. And then in the 70s, the Supreme Court said, yes, she's right. This does belong under under Title VII. But there is still not, uh, in our Constitution, an Equal Rights Amendment. It, it failed to be ratified by three, three states. So constitutionally, women are not recognized uh, with equal eyes under the law. You would like to see that change? Yes, well, we do have uh, the 14th Amendment, which sure. says, uh, nor shall any state denied to any person the equal protection of the laws. Mm -hmm. And we have used that, vote demure, to take us 
almost to the place. Almost. But it's important to have an Equal Rights Amendment in the Constitution, even if the 14th Amendment has been interpreted the way an Equal Rights Provision would. My answer is, why are you still a proponent? My answer to that question, I take out my pocket Constitution. I appreciate that every Constitution in the world written since the year 1950 has the equivalent of a statement that uh, men and women are people of equal citizenship stature. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think my, a few of my granddaughters are here. Three granddaughters yeah. in the audience and her daughter Jane. And I would like to be able to take out that pocket constitution and say to them, you see this statement of the equal stature of men and women? is as fundamental as the other basic human rights, the right to free speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, the equal stature of men and women. It belongs, it belongs in the Constitution, and there had, <clears throat> recently there have been efforts to revive the amendment. Mm -hmm. I hope they succeed. I worry a little bit, and I wonder if you worry about backlash uh, as a result of the Me Too mm -hmm. movement. And, and by that I mean, um, you know, we, we've certainly read a lot of accounts of some women feeling as though they, can no they were no longer being invited on work trips along with their male colleagues or to the dinners with their male colleagues because there is a fear that it may be perceived the wrong way. Can you speak about any concern you have about backlash and any advice you have for women that are dealing with it? I, d I don't think that there will be a serious backlash. It's too widespread. Um, my concern is that it shouldn't stop with prominent people, people like you, people in the media, and that it should protect, this new attitude should protect the maid who works at a hotel. Yes. And I think it is um, spreading so far. Yes, there will always be adjustments when there's a transition, but on the whole, I mean, it's amazing to me that for the first time, women are really listened to because sexual harassment had often been dismissed as, well, she made it up or she's too thin-skinned. So I think it's a very healthy development. Is Washington listening? Is, Is Washington listening? Congress? Are they listening and acting fast enough? Is this, this Congress acting fast? Congress. This Congress is not acting. <laughs> no. But we will get past this time of um, inaction. Is, so that's a no, inaction, that's a no. <laughs> I mean, it, it's been very hard even to keep the government going lately. <laughs> but but you, mentioned, you mentioned my nomination. When the vote was 96 to 3, I had spent about 10 years of my life litigating cases with the American Civil Liberties Union. Not a single Senator asked a question about my ACLU connection. That would not happen today. But I do hope that I will live to see the day when we are back where we were at the time I was nominated, at the time Justice Breyer was nominated. Mm -hmm. There was a true bipartisan spirit. Is there anything that shows you? <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
do you see signs of that that perhaps we do not see? <laughs> My hope is that Congress will think about where the, the United States population now is. And I really am putting my faith in the millennials. You guys. Uh, <laughs> you recently said when you were asked by Charlie Rose um, a year ago, <laughs> if sexism played a role in the 2016 presidential election, and you said, quote, I have no doubt it did. I'm interested in what role you think it played. What role I think it played? I think it was difficult for Hillary Clinton to get by even the, the macho atmosphere prevailing during that campaign. And she was uh, criticized. Uh, in a way, I think no man would have been criticized. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in, uh, anyone who watched watched that campaign unfold would answer the the same way I did. Yes, sexism was. Uh, played a prominent part. Was America not ready for a woman president? Oh, I think I think we were and will be the next time. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, we should be careful about not getting me too much into the political <laughs> arena. <laughs> So let's talk about your mom. <laughs> because I don't know her politics. But your mother, truly, from all accounts I have read, was a remarkable woman. And so much of what you, it seems, have strived for and achieved is because of your mother and for your mother. That she taught you to be fiercely independent but she didn't have the professional opportunities you had. Um, and there is so much it seems she would have accomplished professionally had she had the opportunity. Is that right? When I talk about my mother, I sometimes ask the question, what is the difference between a bookkeeper in the garment district and a Supreme Court justice? Mm. One generation my mother's life and mine. Wow. One of her, her memories, one of her proudest memories was of marching in the suffrage parades to get the vote for, for women. She was a voracious reader and she communicated her love of reading to me. I can still remember as a child sitting in her lap while she was reading a book hmm. to me. As you write your often dissents and your opinions and you reflect on your children and your grandchildren, how much of what you've done, your life's work, do you believe has also been for your mother? Well, she gave me, um, she armed me with uh, the strength uh, to persist, even if, if uh, I am not successful, and never to give up, to keep trying. Mm -hmm. She was unusual for her time because she stressed the importance of being independent. Uh, that is, uh, in the 50s, uh, parents would like their daughters to meet Prince Charming, marry, and live happily ever after. And my mother, I suppose she thought it would be fine 
if I met Prince Charming, but then for yourself was her message, be independent. And then her other message was, be a lady, and by that she didn't mean wear as I do fancy lace gloves. <laughs> uh, she meant don't give way to emotions that just sap your energy and don't get you any place. And that included anger, uh, envy, um, and that has stood me in good, good stead. It has. You will notice, as Justice Ginsburg has fought this fight for equality through the decades, it has always been with a... A, a, uh, the building blocks, not fighting for immediate change at once, but also she was once criticized for, for saying, may I ask, may I ask. But that is something you learn from Justice, Justice Stevens. Stevens. Yes. And then you ask the very tough question. Yes. yes. <laughs> that was his style. In the most gentle way he would say, may I ask? And then he... he asked a question that was just got to the nub of the controversy. I should employ that tactic more so. on cable television. <laughs> Excuse me, Senator, may I ask? Um, three strikes. You have said, and this struck me so much, that you already had three strikes against you, that you were a woman, that you were Jewish, and that you were the mother of a four-year-old. This is as you were just going through law school and, and trying to get your first job. Despite graduating at the top of your law school class, you weren't offered a single job. Same was true for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Really? Justice Sandra Day O'Connor did very well at Stanford Law School. She couldn't find a job with any California law firm. So what did she do? She volunteered to work for free for a county attorney on condition that if she proved satisfactory, they would put her on the payroll. And in that four months, she proved herself to be the best young lawyer in the office mm. and, of course, was then put on the payroll. The difficulty for women of my generation was getting that first job, getting your foot in the door. But once you got the job, you did it at least as well as the men, so that the second job was much less hard. But you, you mentioned uh, the three strikes. They were that I was Jewish, and many of the large law firms in the city were just beginning to accept Jews. The second was I was a woman. I don't know how many times I heard from employers, we had a woman once at this law firm and she was dreadful. <laughs> and how many men have you had that, that didn't work out? <laughs> and then for me, um, the biggest obstacle is sitting at that table. And, <laughs> my Raise daughter Jane Ginsburg. Who Raise is your hand, Jane. <laughs> but one of my fondest memories was my graduation from Columbia Law School. The law school was still in Kent Hall. They had a magnificent library, and Jane was seated in the balcony, so she didn't have any heads to overlook. And when I approached the dean to get my diploma, mm -hmm. she stood up and said, that's my mommy. <laughs> oh. uh, Jane is today the Morton L. Janklow Professor of Liter Literary and Artistic Property Law at Columbia. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think we are the first mother-daughter tenured teachers at any law school in the wow. USA. Bravo.
However, before, well, this would be after that graduation, then you went on to Rutgers Law School, and, and working at Rutgers Law School, this is where your boss was the one who said that it was okay to pay you less because your husband was making a good income. And while you were there, you felt like you had to hide your pregnancy. I was on a year-to-year -year contract, and I feared that if, my, if I disclosed my pregnancy, I would not be rehired. So you wore some big clothes? I wore my mother-in-law's clothes in the spring. <laughs> she was one size larger. And in May, after the last class, I said to my colleagues, when I come back in the fall, there'll be one more person in our family. Hmm. But think how far we've come. Uh, when I found out I was pregnant with our son, I was maybe a month pregnant. And I, you know, was waiting to tell work until three months or so. And early morning, getting ready for my show, my boss walked in, just as he does sometimes, talk about the show. And he said to me, looking at the pictures of our daughter, Sienna, on the wall, not knowing I was pregnant, have as many children as you can. Mm. That's how far we've come. One of the, the, the first set of cases in which I was involved this was still in, in my days at Rutgers, were pregnant school teachers who were put on what was euphemistically called maternity leave, which meant that when you begin to show, you leave, because the children mustn't think that their teacher swallowed a watermelon. <laughs> and then they would ask you back if they needed you, but you had no guaranteed right huh. to return. Wow. And all these women were asking, they, they said, we are ready, willing, and able to continue teaching well beyond the fourth or fifth month. Mm -hmm. And that's all we want to do. Mm. So in another class of people who complained, and these complaints had never been aired before, but the women had the sense that the time was right for a change, mm -hmm. and that society, even the legislatures and the courts, would listen. So another group of women who, blue-collar women, who wanted to get family coverage, health care coverage, and were told, Family coverage is available only to male workers mm -hmm. because women were considered at most pin money earners. So they could get insurance for themselves, mm -hmm. but not for a family. I should know we still have a long way to go. The fact that I can sit here three months fully paid maternity leave is not a reality for most American uh, mothers and fathers right now. So there's a long way still to go, I think. To yes, but how far we have but come. How, exactly, how far we've come. Let me ask you, Justice, uh, and, and then we'll move on. What have you sacrificed? And, and what I mean by that is you have children, you have beautiful grandchildren, you have this flourishing career, but there must have been something you sacrificed for all of it, is there? Um, the question is sometimes asked, or, or said, not as a question, as a statement. Women can't have it all. Um, my response to that is, I have had it all in my long life, but not necessarily at one time. Mm. Because in, in a marriage, one adjusts to the other's needs. So I would say that in the days my husband was intent on becoming a partner in a law firm in five years, during those years, uh, I was the one, um, I carried the laboring oar at home. And, um, but then when I got into the equal rights advocacy business, 
we didn't even have a conversation about it, but my husband sensed that the work I was doing was very important. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter, I think not so much because of the work I was doing, but the realization that her father was a much better cook than her mother. <laughs> um, I, I was phased out of the kitchen in, in those. <laughs> phased out, that's a kind way of putting it. <laughs> There's actually a, the Supreme Court, in, in honor of Marty, her late husband's life, put out a, a cookbook of his best recipes. I mean, he was a true sort of gourmand. He was a, a, quite the cook. It's a supreme chef. It's a collection of his recipes. He had about 150 recipes on a disc. One of my colleagues at Spouses, Martha Analito, decided that the best tribute there could be to my late husband was a cookbook. And she was right. I think Marty would have been overjoyed to have a cookbook with his name on it. When I showed the recipes to my daughter, the recipes that Martha Analito had selected, Jane said, I don't think Daddy would pick those. <laughs> so, so I said, OK, Jane, you select them. If you uh, get this cookbook, you will see in the table of contents, one entry, it says Jane's Caesar salad. There you go. So in addition to Marty's recipe, she has a, one of her own. One of her own. And I, I want to say, she just, at the beginning of February, uh, Jane was speaking somewhere in the D.C. area. And she spent the day, as she does every month or so, cooking for me, making uh, individual dinners, which I then, we then freeze. And when the supply is exhausted, she comes back. because she, <laughs> she feels some responsibility for phasing me out of the kitchen. <laughs> and and so, so wants to assure that, that I am properly nourished. Good on you, Jane. One more note on, on your late husband, Marty. Um, you have said he was the only boy who cared that I had a brain. And you've also said, when fathers are equal parents to their children, only then will women truly be free. And we're not there yet, but the progress is heartening. I have uh, one of my last year's law clerks is this year on uh, parental leave. Hmm. And he's not the first one who has done it that way. When I spoke before about adjusting to your partner's needs, mm -hmm. one of the young men who took uh, parental leave, did so because his wife, who was a doctor, during the year of his clerkship, mm -hmm. took time out to be the principal caretaker of their two children. Mm -hmm. So we're getting there. Anyone who visits my chambers will see now two photographs. One is of my first grandchild and his father. Um, Paul is two months old, and you can see the adoring relationship of this father to the child. Now I have, next to that picture, another one of the then two-month-old as oh. a father himself his holding daughter. his daughter, who was born on January 1st. Congratulations. So let's talk about how this translates to the Supreme Court, to the cases you fought before the court, to the cases you've heard as a sitting justice. The decision, you wrote the majority decision in, uh, in VMI, which was the United States versus Virginia. 
And for anyone not familiar with this case, uh, what the court found is that Virginia Military Institute uh, was acting unconstitutionally with its male-only admissions policy. Now, interesting note that I really appreciate is that Justice O'Connor uh, was going to write the majority opinion, knew how much this meant to you, this case, suggested you write the majority opinion. And I wonder if that is, to you still today, the most meaningful majority opinion you've written. I think so. And the law clerk, Lisa Beatty, who worked with me on that case, is also here today. Uh, we had the great experience of going to VMI a year or so ago. It was supposed to be for the 20th anniversary, but we were a little late, so it turned out to be the 21st. <laughs> and it was simply wonderful to see how many women cadets there were mm. and how they are flourishing. Mm -hmm. VMI has ret retained the rat line, but they have made certain modifications. A, a woman who is a trustee of VMI and was in the first class of women said, it was rocky in the beginning. They said, no concessions for the women. So when they enter, they will have their heads shaved, just like the men. Well, the school got over that. Okay. And now they're very proud of their women. Many of them are in the engineering program. The general, when he told me, apart from the hair, uh, the, the women have exactly the same conditions as the men. We visited their living quarters. They are Spartan, and they are just the same for the men and the women. Mm -hmm. But I. I asked the general, do you allow the men to wear earrings? And he, he, he said, did. He said, not on campus. Okay. <laughs> In the uh, very well-known Lily Ledbetter case, Lily Ledbetter versus Goodyear Tire, a pay discrimination case that you wrote a, uh, what has been described as a scathing dissent in the opinion. Um, and ultimately, many look at your dissent as, as one of your greatest victories. And you, you deemed um, the finding of the court in that case a parsimonious reading of Title VII, reading from the bench that the court is indifferent to insidious ways that men are paid more. You called on Congress to act to reverse this. It was the first uh, bill signed into law under President Obama. Um, but where has, it, where has it taken us and how much Further do we have to go on that front? Well, I'd, I'd say there was a forerunner to Lily Ledbetter. Yep. And it was in the 70s when the Supreme Court decided twice that discrimination on the basis of pregnancy is not discrimination on the basis of sex. sex. How did they reach that conclusion? Well. The world is divided into two types of people. There are the non-pregnant people, and that class includes many women. <laughs> and then there are the pregnant persons. So how could it be gender-based discrimination? Yes. Well, there was a coalition of people from all parts of the political spectrum to right that, right that wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in, I think it must have been about 1978, Congress passed the Pregnancy Discrimination Act with a simple statement, discrimination on the basis of pregnancy is yes. discrimination on the basis of sex. There was a similar uh, groundswell for Lily Ledbetter. Mm -hmm. uh, Lily Led worked as a, um, an area manager in a, in a Goodyear tire plant. When she was hired, she was the only woman doing that job. One day, one of her coworkers put a slip of paper in her mailbox with a series of numbers. 
and she recognized immediately what those numbers were. Mm -hmm. The pay of every area manager. Mm -hmm. She could see from it that she was the lowest paid that the person she had helped train was earning more than she was. So she thought, now it's time to do something about it. She brought a Title VII lawsuit. Title VII is a principal anti-discrimination in employment law. She won a, a substantial verdict from a jury. And the case got to the Supreme Court her claim was dismissed on the ground that she sued too late. Mm. The, the law requires that the woman complain within 180 days of the discriminatory. Even it's, if they don't know what's happened yet? Well, they may know what's happened, but women like Lily have other concerns. If they are the first woman doing the job, they don't want to be seen right. as one who rocks the boat. They don't want to be seen as a complainer. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, if she had complained, first of all, how did she know? They didn't give out, the employer didn't give out salary figures. Mm -hmm. But even if she knew and she had sued immediately, mm -hmm. The defense, it's clear what the defense would have been. It would have been, it has nothing to do with Lily being a woman. She just doesn't do the job as well. But when she files her lawsuit, she's been working there a dozen years, and her employer has given her good performance ratings so that that defense is no longer available to them. She has a winnable case, but she sued too, too late. My theory, and it was one that the Supreme Court, uh, that, the, that had been applied for a long time under the Fair Labor Standards Act, it's that each paycheck she received that reflects that mm -hmm. differential renews the discrimination. Mm. So a complaint filed within 180 days of her latest paycheck is timely. And that's, and that's the change that, that Congress made. I think equal pay is not yet a re reality, but it has advanced beyond even the days when I was teaching at Columbia Law School. I was the law school's representative on the, um, at, the University Senate. There was then a, a commission on the status of women. And the first thing we wanted, we wanted the pay figures. Yeah. And the university was very reluctant hmm. to come forward. But we wanted it just to ensure that the women were getting the, the same pay, but the same work. Did you get it? Eventually, yes. Yeah. Does corporate America need that today? Mm -hmm. Does corporate America need that today? Should all employers? Well, there, there are reasons, I suppose, for not disclosing uh, pay figures. But I think the, the days when it was thought right and proper to pay the woman less. Mm. Uh, we, we told that story before about the, my very kindly dean at Rutgers Law School who said that I would be paid a, a rather low salary. Uh, why? Because my husband had a good paying job in a New York law firm. Can, can, can I ask you, what did you say in response to that? Yeah, well, I said, how much is so-and-so being paid? A man who had been out of law school the same number of years as I had. Yeah. Ruth, he has a wife and two children to support. But the women of the New York campus of Rutgers organized. They didn't bring a Title VII case. They just brought a simple equal pay case. Mm -hmm. 
Eventually, the university settled, and the lowest raise that any woman in the group received, this is 1969, mm -hmm. was $6,000, which is a lot more mm -hmm. then than it is, it is today. In the Hobby Lobby uh, decision, just a few years ago, uh, you wrote uh, a dissent in that. All, all three female justices were in the minor minority dissenting on that case. And the reason I, I bring it up is because you've been asked about it subsequently, and you uh, said of those uh, justices in the majority, uh, they were all male justices, you called it perhaps, in your words, a blind spot. And you said that, that a similar blind spot existed in the Lily Ledbetter decision. What do you believe they were blind to? And do you believe some of your fellow justices still have a blind spot? What were they blind to? That contraceptive coverage was an essential part of health care for a woman. The court was very receptive to the claim of the employer, the religious freedom claim. And my point was the, the, the religious belief of the owners of Hobby Lobby was certainly genuine and worthy of respect. However, they employ hundreds of women who do not share their religious beliefs and who think that they should have complete uh, medical coverage in their, hmm. in their health plan. So my view was if their workforce, if all the women who work for them were of the same belief, that's fine and nobody would complain. But they can't be in a commercial enterprise and not afford their women the same benefits that they could get at the shop next door. That they couldn't project their religious belief onto a workforce mm -hmm. that didn't share it. Is, is the blind spot still there today, as you sit on the bench today? Yes, but less and less over time. Justice Brennan, in one of his opinions, wrote that placing women on a pedestal can be a cage. And you very much agree with that, that, that often laws that are put in place to protect women can actually, in your belief, Justice, have the opposite effect. Yes, well, the, the challenge in those now ancient days was to, to get judges to understand that there was such a thing as gender-based discrimination. The, the thought was that women are sheltered, that they are protected, that they are cared for by their men, so they're sheltered from working at night. They're sheltered from being police officers, firefighters. And that notion, or men would think of themselves as good husbands, good fathers. Mm -hmm. And Brennan was responding to that. He said, uh, when he said the pedestal on which women have been thought to stand, more often than not turns out to be a cage. That is, it confines, it confines mm -hmm. what, what women can do. So it was, getting the justices and the judges of other courts to understand that what they thought was pure favor to women uh, often was a denial of an opportunity. Uh, one area that was fought out in the 70s was, was jury service for women. Even this state, New York, had an exemption for a woman. Any, any woman. That was thought a favor because 
if you have an opportunity not to serve, well, you'd rather do something else than, than sit on a jury. But what, what the law said was uh, jury duty is, is an obligation of citizenship. That's why men must serve. But the women were expendable. Wow. They didn't really need them to participate. Never mind a jury of your peers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and that was the, the first case that uh, brought up that issue was in 1961 when the court was headed by uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren, who was mm -hmm. considered to be a very progressive, had taken the Supreme Court uh, in the direction of um, helping to end apartheid in America. Mm -hmm. the, the case involved a woman, Gwendolyn Hoyt, from Hillsborough County, Florida. She was what we would today call a battered woman. That is her philandering, abusive husband. Uh, was a cruel man. And one day he had humiliated her to the breaking point. Mm -hmm. And so she spied her young son's baseball bat in the corner of the room. She took it and hit him over the head with it. With all her might, he fell against the stone floor. And that was the end of their altercation and the mm -hmm. beginning of the murder prosecution. Gwendolyn Hoyt thought that women on her jury would better understand her state of mind. Not that they would necessarily acquit her, but that they might convict her of the lesser crime of manslaughter rather than murder. Mm -hmm. She was convicted of murder by an all-male jury. And when her case got to the Supreme Court, the justices said, Women have the best of both worlds. They can go into the clerk's office and volunteer to serve on a jury if they want to. But if they don't volunteer, we won't distract them from being the center of home and family life. Mm. That case in 1961 contrasts with the cases that started 10 years later in 1971 mm -hmm with a no longer, quote, liberal chief justice. Mm. And yet, the court in that decade of the 70s struck out dozens of laws, state and federal, on the ground that they differentiated impermissibly mm -hmm. on the basis of gender. Why was there that different reaction? It's because the judges are not never out in front in a social change. They tend to trail where society is. Mm. And society had changed. Right. Uh, and I can put it in, in this way. When my daughter started school, there were very few working moms. Just 10 years later, in the mid-60s, when my son was born, it was not at all unusual to have two earners in a family. Let me switch gears and ask you uh, about the attacks on the judiciary. Last year, Chief Justice Roberts went out of his way uh, in writing his praise for uh, all of the justices, for the judiciary branch as a whole. Uh, we have seen quite a few attacks on the judiciary from the highest levels. Are these attacks bad for the country? Are they something that we've seen through history and should be and can be tolerated? Where do you fall? I think the independence of our federal judiciary is one of our nation's hallmark and pride. Uh, judges can't defend themselves. They depend on members of the bar and the public 
to help preserve that institution, do the job that was intended for it, that is to judge impartially without respect to persons. Um, and, and it is distressing when the people regard the judiciary as just another political branch of government. I can say of the court on which I serve that although the press tends to play up the 5-4 divisions, we are unanimous much more often than we divide 5-4. There is a, a collegial spirit that prevails. The Supreme Court is more collegial than any other place I've ever worked. There is a, a strong desire to keep the judiciary mm. in the place that it has held. Even though there have, has been criticism, and criticism if it's the right kind, is, is constructive. But on the whole, com compare, say, take a poll of the people, what they think of the court versus what they think of Congress <laughs> or the executive branch. Mm. And the judiciary comes out way ahead. So, so you would agree, though, with your fellow justice, your newest colleague, Justice Gorsuch, when he told Senator Blumenthal last year during his confirmation process that he felt that the attacks on the judiciary branch were, quote, disheartening and demoralizing. Well, they are disheartening, yes. But there are people, lawyers, who speak out in defense of an independent judiciary and point out how important that is mm. to our system. Let me ask you about the free press. You live in the Watergate, correct? Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> and Watergate, uh, the scandal, may never have been uncovered without the free press. Do you feel that the free press is threatened today? And what is your view as you look at it in totality with the attacks on the judiciary, on law enforcement, the intelligence community, the press? What does it tell you? Well, I would like to turn that question around and ask you if you feel threatened in that regard. On the whole, I think the press has done very well uh, not uh, giving way to uh, the criticism from some um, people in, in the political arena. So do you, when, when you're reporting, do you feel, do, do, do you see it as? I feel protected by the Constitution. Good. <laughs> you could see, you could take it. Uh, not as something that makes you fearful, but something that's a challenge. I feel protected <laughs> by our laws. Um, and I wonder, as someone who has lived through a few more administrations than I have, if what you think these attacks say about our society, does it concern you? It's been that way from the very beginning. To this level? Of, of the, the press and, I mean, one of our greatest founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, was, That's true. It was terribly distressed at what the press was reporting about him he didn't think that the press should be squelched. Do, do you think that those holding the highest offices now politically think the press should be squelched? Well, <laughs> I, I will uh, not respond to that question, but, uh, <laughs> but a free press is 
of tremendous importance to a society. All right, so two more quick questions and I wanna to get to a few audience questions because some, uh, some Columbia grads and current students have questions, but let me just ask you this because um, I, uh, I was on the air the day that your dear friend and former uh, colleague, Justice Antonin uh, Scalia, died. And it was a shock to all of us, and it was quite a shock to you. And for anyone in this room who doesn't know, uh, they had an incredibly close friendship and respect, despite being uh, on opposing sides very often in their decisions. Um, and you have said, I loved Nino, but I could have strangled him. <laughs> <laughs> what can we learn as we sit here today in, an, in a truly divided America, in a divided Washington, from the friendship that you and, and Justice Scalia shared? There is an opera, a comic <laughs> opera, uh, called Scalia Ginsburg. I know. And it, it portrays the, the two of us. Um, Justice Scalia enters with a rage aria in which he sings. The justices are blind. How can they possibly spout this? The Constitution says absolutely nothing about this. And I come on the scene in my lyric soprano voice and tell him, <laughs> He's searching for bright line solutions to problems that don't have easy answers. But the great thing about our Constitution is that like our society, it can evolve. So that sets up the difference in uh, our approaches. Scalia is locked in a dark room being punished for excessive dissenting. Hmm. And I emerge, if they could set the stage this way, through a glass ceiling, <laughs> and to help him get through the trials he must pass to get out of the dark room. There's a character, the commentatore, who is administering the tests, and he is puzzled. He said, why would you want to help him? He's your enemy. And I explain, he's not my enemy. He's my dear friend. And then we sing a duet. <laughs> uh, the duet is we are different, we are one. Different in our approach to the interpretation of legal texts, one in our reverence for the Constitution and for the institution we serve. Well, I believe that Senator Grassley, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, asked for a copy of the opera. Well, we, we had, in fact, it was in November. The House and Senate Judiciary Committees asked to have excerpts from the opera. And we did this at the Library of Congress. I made some remarks on that occasion. The not so subtle effort was to show how people can be collegial, respect, genuinely like each other, mm -hmm. although they may disagree on some very important questions. So uh, Justice Scalia and I, um, even when, when we were on opposite sides, I would sometimes criticize uh, to, to him uh, an opinion for being over the top, for being too extreme, suggesting he would be more persuasive if he toned it down. Mm -hmm. He never listened to that advice. <laughs> but he did occasionally call me or come to my chambers with a draft opinion that I had just circulated to point out the grammatical errors mm -hmm. <laughs> I made. The two of us uh, had some things in common. One was uh, our love of family. Mm -hmm. 
and the other our love of opera. So we were mm -hmm. supernumeraries, extras, uh, uh, two times at the Washington National Opera. Uh, we went to the opera together in various places, including uh, Scalia thought that he done, didn't like Wagner at all. He just couldn't tolerate that. <laughs> he came to the Met to the performance of Valkyrie, and mm. he was overwhelmed by the beauty of, wow. of the music. A beautiful friendship that I think all of us can learn in Washington right now can learn a lot from. Two questions uh, from some people in the audience here or watching the live stream. Sona Lee, a journalism class of 2017, sent this question to us. Can you describe a time when you struggled with great personal doubt or feelings of inadequacy? My first day in law school. There was someone in the class who volunteered to answer the professor's question. He was brilliant. I came home at the end of the day and said to my husband, if they're all that smart, I'll never make it in this place. Well, then I decided that this person would be my model, that I would speak in class as often as he did. Mm. This brilliant person was in your line of business. He was Tony Lewis, who, uh, among other things, reported on the Supreme Court for the New York Times. He had a Neiman Fellowship that year at mm -hmm. Harvard. So he was taking my basic civil procedure class and federal courts and constitutional law. Wow. And so the, yes, I felt very inadequate that uh, other moments of feeling inadequate. So my first argument at the Supreme Court. In those days, the court heard more cases than it does now, so it sat morning and afternoon. The argument in which I participated was an afternoon argument. Mm -hmm. I was terribly nervous. I didn't dare eat anything for lunch. But then I looked up at that bench, the nine most important judges in the United States. I had a captive audience. Yes. They had no place to go. They had to, <laughs> had to listen to me. And then suddenly, instead of feeling nervous and inadequate, I, a great feeling of power came over me. And, <laughs> and my mission was kind of like a kindergarten teacher. To, to, they have no remote to turn you off. Like, yeah. people can turn me off all the time. <laughs> Tristan Duville from Engineering and Applied Sciences, the class of 2021, uh, wrote in, what do you think about when you wake up in the middle of the night? You should know she works all night and writes yeah. opinions yeah. till 4 in the morning. So what do you think about when you wake up at 5 a.m.? Well, my husband had a theory that I should stop working, and he said, after a night's sleep, your mind will be clearer. Yes. And I never trusted myself enough. If I have a hot pen, I want to keep write, okay. writing. But it, it does that. I, I, am, I go to sleep generally thinking about some challenging case and how I'm going to work it out. Uh, Alicia Shaifem, Columbia College, class of 2018. Who have your most important female mentors been? Uh, in the ancient days, when I went to college and I went to law school, there were no female mentors. There were no female teachers. The closest I came to uh, someone I admired and wanted to be like was Nancy Drew, a fictional character. <laughs> And then the real life character was Amelia Earhart. Mm. Yeah.
So there is, for those who may not know, it's coming, a new CNN film about you. It was just premiered at Sundance. You saw it for the first time there. Uh, the executive producer of it, Amy Antelis, is in the audience here today. And I want to know why you decided to let cameras follow you around for days on end in your office, in your home, and what story you were hoping to tell. In my not unbiased opinion, I thought they did a fantastic job with RBG. <laughs> Me too. So. The, the two filmmakers, uh, Betsy West and Judy Cohn, had done a PBS series called The Makers. Mm -hmm. It was about the women's movement in the 1970s. And I was tremendously impressed mm. by how they uh, portrayed it. And so when they asked, uh, if they could do this, I thought if, they, if it's anything like the makers, it's going to be very good and educational. And entertaining. Film as there, well. there is another film that will come out uh, probably the end of this year called On the Basis of Sex. My nephew wrote this script. And it's about a case in which my husband and I were co-counsel, mm -hmm. a, a gender discrimination case. When I asked my nephew why he picked that case, which went to the Court of Appeals, but not to the Supreme Court, he said because he wanted to tell a story, not just of the gender discrimination case, but of a marriage. Mm -hmm. So I have high expectations for, for that film. As well. <laughs> as, we, as we wrap up here, uh, as I mentioned at the open, um, Justice Ginsburg survived cancer twice, didn't miss a day on the bench. So how could I miss this interview, right? <laughs> You've now, I did have a, a, a model for my cancer bouts, and it was Sandra Day O'Connor. Mm -hmm who had breast cancer and massive surgery. She was on the bench nine days after her surgery. Wow, quite a model. So I had about three weeks, because my colorectal cancer surgery was in the very beginning of September. Mm -hmm. you, you've said that surviving cancer has given you, in your words, an enhanced appreciation for the joys of life. What have you loved most in this life? Uh, what have I loved most huh? in this life? The tremendous luck that I, I have had. I, know I am a very lucky woman, starting with my dear spouse uh, and my family two children of whom I'm very proud and along the, the way they're growing up years they were presented certain challenges. <laughs> Thank you for the warning. <laughs> when I, I love beautiful music. I love the work I do. I think I have the best job in the world for a lawyer. Uh, I respect all of my colleagues and genuinely like most of them. <laughs> <sighs> but I have never worked in a more collegial yeah. place than, than the Supreme Court. Uh, this. Well, let me give you a few examples. We have a tradition. It was started by Chief Justice Melville Fuller at the end of the 19th century. And it's the handshake. Mm. Before we sit to hear oral arguments, before we confer, we go around our conference room, each justice shaking hands 
with every other. It's as if to say, maybe I was miffed yesterday when you circulated that nasty dissent, but <laughs> we are in this together and we revere the court and want to leave it in as good shape as we found it. We, we lunch together every day that we sit and every day that we confer. Mm -hmm. We celebrate Justice's birthdays. With the chief, we'll bring in some wine and we have a happy birthday toast. We have two music halls a year, of which uh, I superintend them, and that's a great joy for yeah. me. We have welcoming dinners. Every time a new justice comes on board, it's the responsibility of the the person who's just given up the junior justice job to make a dinner in honor of the new justice. Mm -hmm. We travel together, mm -hmm. uh, not only in the United States, but all over the world. So one of the famous pictures of Justice Scalia and me is we are riding on a very elegant elephant <laughs> in <laughs> Jaipur. So there's a, a, a lot of togetherness. Yeah. So final question. Help me finish this sentence, okay? There will be enough female oh. justices on the Supreme Court when there are? You know what the answer is. When there are nine, of course. <laughs> Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. Thank you. OK. Oh. Thank you, thank you. Justice Ginsburg, Poppy Harlow, thank you so much for this gift today. <laughs> Women of Columbia, the lionesses have roared this weekend. I would like to thank everyone again for putting this weekend together, even from the initial idea of saying Columbia University needs its first women's conference and brought together over a thousand alumni and students today. So thank you to everyone who worked so tirelessly to put all the details together. It's been incredible. They did all this work and now it's time for us to do our work. We've been inspired this weekend, we've been challenged, we've been motivated, and we have to take all of that energy now and remember this great alumni network of sisterhood that exists here in Columbia and take it out into the world and to stay involved. So I encourage everyone to stay involved with Columbia pick up on this momentum, this excitement that we've generated this week, and different ways to stay involved. Follow us online, share your stories, come to more events, consider being a mentor for another student or another alumna, and make sure you return again and again to Columbia. Please stay connected with us. It's been a glorious weekend. Thank you so much. Let's continue to open doors, and let's continue to roar. Thank you, Columbia.